Hi, everybody. And welcome back to our uh, Birds of Newfoundland series. This is our 12th and final evening. Um, so uh, some of you have been here the whole time with us and some of you are maybe new here tonight and welcome all. We're glad to have all of you here. We're going to be talking about birding by ear tonight. And my name is Jenna McDermott for any of you who haven't met me yet. And Catherine Dale, my colleague is also on the call as well. She'll be monitoring the chat um, and helping out with anything that pops up as we go along. So we both work for an organization called Birds Canada. Birds Canada is a nonprofit organization that exists across the country where um, we have a mission to drive action to increase the understanding, appreciation and conservation of birds in Canada. Um, and so we run a lot of different programs across the country. And most of these are um, supported, I guess, or mostly run by citizen scientists. And those are regular people who have a passion for birds and they collect the data in a format that goes along with the project. And we get all of this uh, amazing data sets that we can really do a fantastic analyses on and really help to conserve the birds in Canada. Um, and across the country right now, we have more than 70,000 volunteers and we have staff across the country as well. So right now in Newfoundland, Somehow we, was open to windows. we are running um, one project called the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. And I won't go too much into detail because we've probably belabored this point for many of you at this point. Um, but we are attempting to map the distribution and abundance of all the different species of birds that breed on the island of Newfoundland. And so you can see um, we have a greater yellow legs picture here and the map that you can see is all the places that it has been detected in the last two summers during our field seasons. We're going into our third field season this year and then we'll have two more after that before this project is over. Um, and so since the Atlas is run through donations and grants, if you would like a way to show your appreciation for this series of webinars um, that we've been putting on this winter, we would welcome donations of any size. This is of course not required. Um, we're happy to have anybody here, whether they donate or not, but it would be appreciated. And so um, you can go to our website uh, to the get involved tab and then the donate button if you would like to do that. Um, just be sure to indicate that you'd like the funds to go to the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas if you're um, planning to donate. And I'll put this information up on the last slide of today's presentation as well. Our second project that we have running in Newfoundland is the Nocturnal Owl Survey and Catherine heads that up. Um, we're right in the middle of it right now actually. So probably some of you on the call here are signed up for routes around the island. Um, this is also in Labrador as well. And people go out for one evening in the early spring and listen for owls basically, um, and then submit the data to um, this long-term data set that we have. So if you have questions about that or want to get involved, feel free to reach out to us for sure. And as always, I would just like to thank all of our partners and funders. The Atlas is a huge project and without having so many people supporting us, we definitely wouldn't be able to succeed in it. And we also wouldn't be able to put on a webinar series like we are today. So thank you to all of these folks. To get into the meat of things today, um, this is what we're going to be going through. First, we're going to talk about what sort of sounds birds make and why they make them. Then we're going to um, watch a video actually of one of my other colleagues from Ontario who's going to talk about the basics of birding by ear. Um, then I'll discuss a little bit about how you can visualize bird song. And then we'll go through several species in Newfoundland and we'll sort of go through some practice, practice things to watch for or to listen for, I guess, when you're identifying birds by ear for each of those. Then we'll talk a little bit about using technology for bird song identification. We'll go through a little bit of a quiz for fun at the end, um, since it's always been popular. And then I'll talk to you about a few of the resources that you can use to help you while you're learning to bird by ear. So to start off, we'll talk about the different bird sounds that birds can make. And the first one that I'll talk about is songs. And so each species 
does have its own song, which is distinguishable to the birds of that species and also sometimes quite easily to humans or only with a lot of practice to humans. If um, that bird song is complex or sounding similar to other species songs. So I'll play for you right now the song of a black-throated green warbler. You heard it actually, if you were here a bit early, there was one singing um, at the beginning there on the recording that was playing, but here it is. So that song um, is quite distinct and it's unlike any other species song that we have in Newfoundland. So that's a good one um, to start learning as well um, because it's not so confusing compared to other ones. But if you, if you paid attention to that just now, you'll notice that um, it's a bit of a complex song. There's multiple notes, it's quite melodic. And this is, um, these are things that are similar for songs for most species of songbirds, especially. So they often have lots of notes that are together in sections. They can have repeated parts and they're often quite melodic. Birds will use songs for mate attraction in the spring. And because singing is quite energetically expensive, it uses a lot of energy for them to sing for many hours of the day. It can indicate to females how healthy a male is and also how good at defending a territory he might be. So being a good singer is an incredibly important part of having a successful breeding season for a bird. Um, birds will also use songs to defend their territories. They will sing to tell other individuals that they own this particular section of habitat. And individual birds can actually recognize the songs of their neighbors. Um, and so between the neighboring birds, they've already decided on their territory boundaries. So if they hear the song of a neighboring bird, all they'll do is probably sing back to it um, just to show that they are still there on their territory. But if a new individual comes and sings a song, then the uh, individual we're talking about is more likely to go and find that bird and it might come to a more physical altercation or a chase um, since that the new individual might be looking to invade the territory. So songs can also be used um, to save energy for a bird so that they're not chasing their regular neighbors to defend their territory. They're only chasing new birds. You usually will hear bird songs um, during breeding season. So in the early spring and through the summer. And during the day, you'll hear them mostly in the dawn chorus and um, the rest of the early morning. Not very much in the afternoon. Birds are quite quiet in the afternoon and you'll hear them again at dusk for some species. Bird sounds can also come in the form of calls. And so I showed you the sound or the song of the black-throated green in that last slide. And I'll just play the call of this black-throated green warbler now. So as you can hear, it's just this short, simple little chip note, um, very much less complex and um, quite simple. So when we're learning bird sounds, it's often best to learn songs first. As you could imagine, it's a little bit easier. Um, however, even though calls are difficult to learn, they're very useful to the birds themselves and they have a lot of different uses actually. So uh, birds will use calls for a lot of reasons, one of which is to maintain contact between a mated pair um, as they go about their day, feeding, foraging, defending the territory, um, sitting on the nest, all that sort of thing. They will also use calls during flight in migration. So sometimes uh, a lot of songbirds will migrate at night. And so if you listen, when it's nighttime during the spring or fall migration seasons, you can sometimes hear quiet little call notes coming down from the sky. Chicks will also use begging calls to convince their parents to feed them, like these northern flickers that you can see here. Those chicks are waiting to get fed, and you can hear what they sound like here.
So as you can hear, um, chicks begging are quite insistent. And it's interesting because a study in Europe showed that chicks that begged louder were provided more food by their parents. So it's actually a very important sort of call for young birds to use um, so that they get proper provisions. Calls can also be used to sound an alarm because of a predator being nearby, or they can be used by adult birds and prompt their young to do something like leaving their nest for the first flight or hiding in the bushes if there's a predator around. So they are really um, multi-purpose. And because of this, calls are used all year round. They're not just during the breeding season and they're also heard all day long as well, rather than just the morning or evening. Birds can also make non-vocal sounds. And we've talked about a couple of these um, throughout the winter here during our webinars. And one of the most common ones we've talked about is the feather sounds of a Wilson snipe. So I'll play it for you here. So that winnowing sound is actually made by air going through the tail feathers of a Wilson snipe as it flies in the sky, um, displaying for females. Um, another bird that uses feather sounds for displaying and territory uh, defense is the ruffed grouse, which you see in the picture here. And it actually drums its wings, it like flaps its wings really quickly towards its body. And it makes this low thumping sound. Um, and it sounds almost like a generator starting sort of far away. And you can almost feel it in your chest rather than hear it with your ears. So that's why I don't have a recording of it because they're actually very difficult to get a recording of. Um, but they also use this for territorial defense and mate attraction. Another really common non-vocal uh, sound that birds make is from woodpeckers. So they'll drum on hollow trees or poles or siding or anything really loud. And this isn't drumming for food. This is just drumming as sort of their version of a song. And they use it as a part of territory display and to attract mates as well. And we also uh, see the non-vocal sounds are typically done during breeding season because they're typically part of um, some sort of mating display or territory defense as well. Um, and I just wanted to mention that something to be aware of when you're learning songs is that the same species can actually sound different depending on the geographic location. And so these are called dialects. Um, and so just be aware of this as you listen to recordings of birds if you're practicing. And also if you've learned some species and then move or go on vacation somewhere else, it might sound different from it uh, than it does in Newfoundland. So for example, um, I'll let you listen to a white-throated sparrow that's from out west. And you'll, uh, a common phrase that people use to describe white-throated sparrow song is, oh sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. And out west actually, they now sing, oh sweet Canna, Canna, Canna. So I'll let you listen to that. So that was, oh, sweet, canna, 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 canna. <laughs> but in Newfoundland, they sing a different version and it sounds like this. So they still have three syllables in the last notes. They say, oh, sweet, Canada, Canada, Canada. So that's just something to be aware of if you're traveling around um, or while you're listening to recordings. And some of you might be wondering why you should learn how to bird by ear or why this could be interesting. And I guess most of you probably have some interest in it since you're here already tonight. <laughs> um, but some, some other interesting things to note are um, that actually 75% of birds are typically de detected by sound alone on bird surveys. Um, this was found in a study in North Carolina forest. So 75% of birds were detected only by sound, whereas 3% of birds were detected only by sight. And so these numbers obviously will change a little bit depending on location and habitat type, um, but you will always hear more birds than you see. 
And you can sort of see this portrayed in the picture that I have here, where you might hear birds singing at each of these little note symbols, but you'll really maybe only see one bird sitting in the bush that's close to you. Um, so learning bird songs and learning to bird by ear could just open up a whole new world of exciting birds around you. <laughs> and um, you can get a huge amount of enjoyment from just knowing which birds are around. I personally find it entirely entertaining to bird in my bed <laughs> while the window's open or bird in a tent when you can't see anything and you can still listen to the dawn chorus and know who is out there. This is also a great way for people who are visually impaired to get involved with birding as well. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to play this video now um, from my colleague out in Ontario, Andres, and he describes some of the basics of birding by ear. It's gonna be around seven minutes, but he covers a lot of the um, basic points really, really well, and he's quite enthusiastic. So I think you'll enjoy this. Birding by ear lesson six, using sound to identify birds. Bird identification is the ability to recognize and pay attention to detail. In this session, you will learn the main elements of a bird song, strategies to learn and memorize bird calls, and essential resources to get you started. The one thing you will need to do is to find your learning style. Your birding by ear style is the best way for you to listen, learn, and remember songs. The best strategy is to start small with a few calls of widespread and locally common birds. You naturally have more ready access to these birds, and by concentrating on this small number of species, you can begin to pick up details in the rhythm, pitch, patterns, and vocal quality of the songs. The small selection of common birds will become your building blocks. Each song you learn will provide insight into the next song you encounter. Let us go step by step. First, how to listen. Anyone who has a novel and intense experience, such as hearing many bird calling at the same time, could feel overwhelmed. To prevent this, you should focus on just one song. Next, don't try to get the whole song on one go. Get the clues, little by little. First, Feel the rhythm of the song, then note the pitch, and then feel the tone. There is no hurry. Second, what to listen for. Once you can get a good, clear listen of a bird song, start noticing the following properties of the call or song. Rhythm. Is the song fast or slow? Is there a change in speed in the song, or does it stay the same? Blue-headed vireos take their time when they sing, while red-eyed vireos sing in a hurry. Pitch. Is it high or low? Do you hear a variation within the song? The pitch is best compared with other species. Note if the song is rising or falling. Smaller species typically have a higher voice, and large birds, like a raven or a duck, usually have deeper voices. Some birds rise as the black-throated blue warbler. Others descend like a viri. Repetition. Try to find the pattern of the call or song. Some birds repeat phrases before they move to a new note. Oven birds make the same sound many times in a row. While chestnut cider warblers say please 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 three times before it ends in to meet you. Focal quality is the hardest but most critical ability to master for bird identification by ear. It is the description of a song, 
Many times I find descriptions and they make no sense to me until I hear the bird. You will have to find a way of describing the song. There are whistles, like the black cap chickadee. Some songs are flute-like, such as that of a hermit thrush. Others sound more like a buzz, for example, a zabana sparrow. And others are more like a hoot of the morning dove. Let us use the yellow warbler as an example of vocal quality. Listen to one of them. When it comes to rhythm, the song has a medium speed and it gets faster near the end. It's repetitive with a pattern. The pitch is emphatic and the vocal quality, it's sweet. And it can be described by the mnemonic, sweet, 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 sweeter than sweet. This brings me to the easiest birds to remember. Those, like the yellow warbler, that can be described with a mnemonic. A mnemonic is a phrase or a group of letters that helps you to remember a sound. The yellow warbler is the perfect example. Did you hear the sweet, 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 sweeter than sweet? If you didn't, don't worry. I didn't either until the third time. Here it goes again. There are other aspects that you will perceive more intuitively. Pay attention to speed, volume, and length of the songs. Some will be very fast, while others will be incredibly short, and some will be so loud you can hear them echoing through the forest. Now that we are aware of some key elements, we should consider our own differences in learning styles. Some people may need to listen to a live or recorded bird vocalization over and over again in order to memorize the calls. Others have to find the bird in the field and see it vocalizing to be able to remember. Some listeners are able to hear a sound just once to remember it. For most of us, the most important thing is to draw on the sounds we already know and consider what made them stick. The goal is to start finding similarities and differences between birds. Consider the similarities and differences in sounds produced by different birds. Variation in voice follows specific patterns. Related species tend to have similar calls and songs. For example, the majority of warblers sound like they are warbling. while the majority of thrushes sound like they have very elaborate whistles. You will have to try to remember the songs so you can match them with the original sound library afterwards. My final suggestion to improve the possibilities of remembering a call in the field is to try to create mnemonics that help you, like this bird. I would try and remember as Whippoorwill. Another strategy can be to imitate the call. You might discover that you are a brilliant bird imitator. You can also use technology. The majority of cell phones have incredibly directional microphones for recording the mysterious bird so you can listen again later at home for identification purposes. Birding by ear. Okay, um, so I think that Andres did a really good job of sort of showing us what we should be listening for as we're going through um, bird songs and learning bird songs. And we're gonna just practice now ourselves together. Um, and so I'll just sum up a little bit of what he said is that some of, you know, the key to learning to bird by ear is sort of to approach it with patience. So it is a very difficult thing to do because humans are much better at learning things visually or remembering visual things or picking out visual things than they are sounds. So sounds can, um, they can appear different to different people. So it's hard to describe them with words. And they're also hard to remember later on um, to sort of try and look them up 
without having a reference to go off of. So it is going to take time to learn birds by song, but just have fun with it and take it in small steps. Um, and so what we're going to do is just start with some of our most common species that probably a lot of you have heard around your houses already. Maybe you don't know what they are or not, um, but we'll go through some of the key things. Um, and then hopefully with time, as you start learning more birds by ear, you'll go from having a lot of songs being unfamiliar to being familiar with them, and then eventually being able to identify them. And then um, in each of the slides, I'm going to be showing you um, how to visualize songs. So these are with spectrograms. And this is what a spectrogram looks like. It's basically seeing sound, um, seeing sound in a way that is easier to understand for the human brain, I guess. Um, so basically it shows the volume of the sound um, based on how dark the lines are in, in the center here. Um, so if they're darker, it's a louder sound. And if they're lighter, then it's a quieter sound. Um, it shows the notes sort of going up and down as if you were reading music and the time goes across left to right. So basically a spectrogram can show you how pitch changes through a song or how the notes change. It shows you the duration of the songs as well as the pauses between songs, which can be also quite important. And um, it can be easy to examine the parts of a song in detail or make comparisons within or between songs. Um, if you're looking at a spectrogram. So I'll just play the two species that I have here. The one on the top is a hermit thrush and the one on the bottom is a savanna sparrow. And you can just try and follow along um, on the spectrogram while you're listening to the song uh, to see if you can see how it shows itself on the spectrogram. So this is the hermit thrush first. So there's one section there. So you can see how each of the sections of song shows up with a pause in between. Um, and you can see how the notes go up and down on the spectrogram. So then I'll play the Savannah Sparrow and you can see how it sounds different and also how it appears different on the spectrogram. Maybe that one's a little bit quieter. So I'll play it again in case any of you didn't hear it. Oops, I have to go back. We're gonna hear the hermit thrush again. <laughs> oh no, things are not working. <laughs> okay. So that's the Savannah Sparrow. So you can see how it has these repeated notes at the beginning and then it goes into this buzzy lower section. So I'm going to have one of these spectrograms with each of, this, each of the species that we're going to look at now. And so we're going to do some practicing. Um, as I said, I'm going to start with the most common species or ones that I think are pretty common around the island. And we'll just sort of go through talking about what pitch they are, whether it's a rising or falling or monotone, meaning all the same pitch. Um, the speed of the song, if it's slow or fast. So slow basically means you can count each of the notes as it as it appears, whereas fast, it's too fast to count each note, um, and whether they're the same notes or or different if different notes. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about tone, which is a tricky one to describe, like on just said. Um, but we could include things like whistle, hoot or coo, ticking, buzzy sounds, nasal sounds. There's lots of descripting, descriptive words to use for that. Um, and then I'll show you some of the mnemonics that I've heard before for these common species. And we can also, uh, you can make up your own anytime. Um, and these topics, um, you can get little, some more in-depth information on uh, the descriptions within each of these uh, topics here as well. And I'll send some links from a website called Ear Birding for anyone who wants to read more about uh, details about all of those things in the follow-up email. So the first species we'll start with is the American Robin. And I'm pretty sure probably most people have seen an American Robin and likely heard one singing as well. So this is what it sounds like. So 
So that's maybe a familiar sound for people um, in the morning or the first songs of spring. And so when we talk about the pitch of this song, um, we have multiple notes. So they're sort of rising and falling, um, alternating between rising and falling throughout the song. The speed is quite slow and steady, so you could definitely count every note as it comes out. And we don't really have any repetition of, of sounds in here. It's sort of different notes all the time. And the tone is a pretty clear kind of whistle. And people say that American Robins say cheerily, cheer up, cheer up, cheerily, cheer up in these sort of little phrases. So I'll just let you listen to them again. And you can see if you can um, pick out some of those ideas. Wonderful. So we'll move on to our next bird, which is the American black duck. And again, I think this is one that probably most people have heard before and seen before um, in Newfoundland. Um, and so this is what an American black duck sounds like. This is a call, I guess, not a song, um, but it's very distinct. So this is sort of your quintessential kind of quacking duck. And so a lot of ducks don't sound like they're quacking in this way, um, but the American black duck, definitely a mnemonic we can use for it is just quack. <laughs> and if you look at the spectrogram at the bottom there, you'll see um, that it, it looks the same across the board. There's just the same sort of note coming out every time repeated. Um, so the repetition is the same note repeated through the whole time. Um, with these pauses between. So it's quite a slow song, quite a slow call as well. Um, the tone is a bit tricky to describe, or at least I struggle describing it. So if you have an idea of the vocal quality or the tone that it uses, you could write that in the chat um, of what you think it sounds like, but I could say maybe rough or nasally. Tell me what you think. <laughs> I'll just play it again for everyone to listen to. Yeah, so that's the American black duck. Okay. Oh, it's quacking again. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to the white-throated sparrow. This is one I think probably a lot of people have heard, even if you're not sure what it's been. And I've played it already um, in this presentation, but we'll play it again now so you can remember it even more. Okie dokie. So that's the white-throated sparrow. So if we look down at the spectrogram, you can see uh, the notes are going straight across. They're not rising or falling, each of the individual notes. So we have these sort of monotone single notes, but the song itself still changes um, from low to high and then stays the same. The speed is again quite slow. You can count each individual note. And um, we do have some of the same sounds repeated at the end of the song. The tone for white-throated sparrow, I'd say is sort of like a sweet whistle or a strong whistle maybe. And as I've said before, um, the mnemonic that a lot of people use for white-throated sparrows is, oh sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. So I'll let you listen to him again. And something that I personally really think is entertaining about white-throated sparrows and all species actually, is that young birds that are just born in uh, that summer, they need to learn their songs. They don't um, innately know the song of their species. They have to learn it by listening to adults singing around them. And so they also need to practice before they can sing properly. Um, so white-throated sparrows especially, I think are entertaining if you listen in sort of the late summer, the young birds are just learning how to sing and practicing 
and you'll just hear these very ridiculous young white throated sparrows sort of butchering the song and being very silly. Um, so if you hear some very weird variations of songs in the later summer, that could be why. Okay, here's another one, the common loon that um, maybe some of you know if you have a place, a cabin uh, on a pond or a leak. And um, they're sort of the sound of summer in Canada, one might say, but here's what they sound like or one of the sounds that they make. So that's, um, this so song is called the yodel, I believe, if you're looking um, in bird books, <laughs> singing again, um, in any field guides and stuff like that, they'll probably call that the yodel. Um, and that's the one that loons will use for a territorial display and uh, to stay in touch with their mate if they're far away on the lake. They, loons also have a lot of different other songs. You may have heard them. Um, at dusk or later in the night, they'll sing a lot of different different songs as well. But this one that we heard, the pitch of it sort of rises at the beginning and then rises and falls through the end. The speed is slow again, so you can definitely count each note separately. And the tone um, I would describe as maybe eerie or, or maybe sort of sad sounding. Um, but again, tone is a really hard one to describe, but it's something that's really important um, to be able to recognize the species. Even if uh, an individual is singing a different variation on a song, the tone of the species will remain the same. So it's the hardest one to learn, but it's probably the most important one as well. And again, I don't think there's a mnemonic for a common loon, but they have a very distinct sound. Okay, so this is the Savannah Sparrow. Um, and it, it came up in Andres's little section as well as um, I played it earlier, but I'll play it for you again here. So we have, um, sort of a monotone section at the beginning with the with the same pitch at the beginning and then it goes down a little bit in these uh, longer buzzier notes at the end. And the speed is slow again on the Savannah Sparrow. Um, you can count each note separately. So we do have, and you can see them on the spectrogram again, we've looked at this before, just each of the notes at the beginning coming through um, repeated and then having new notes at the end. And the tone is, uh, buzzier or almost insect-like. Um, and a mnemonic for the Savannah Sparrow, um, I like it because it's basically just their name is Sasa Sasa Vanna. So I'll play that for you again. Okay, so we're going into a few other species that are maybe a little less familiar to people, um, but they they all have sort of more distinct sounds, I think. Um, so uh, I think they're worth looking at. And it also gives us a bit of practice about uh, looking at other variations of pitch, speed, repetition, and tone. So this is the purple finch, and it's quite a bit different than the ones we've listened to already. I'll let you hear it. So the pitch for the purple finch is quite variable. It goes up and down a lot. There's a lot of different notes. Um, and um, the speed is quite fast. So for this bird, you can't count each of the notes as it goes through, um, rather than the past ones where, where they've been very slow. We don't really have any repetition in the song of the purple finch. It's all different notes. And so when it's a fast song with all different notes, we call that a warble. 
Um, and that's what it means when we say something is warbling. It's, it's singing a bunch of different notes really quickly. And the tone of this bird is maybe bright or rich. It has a sort of bright, rich sound, very happy. And again, I don't think there's a mnemonic for this because it'd be hard to put words to this sort of crazy sound, but I'll let you listen to it again and just uh, look along this spectrogram as well to see how the notes are rising and falling. Wonderful. Okay, so here is a dark-eyed junco. And dark-eyed juncos are quite common around the island, but you maybe haven't noticed their song very much before. Um, but they are actually singing already. I've heard some just the other day. Uh, so we definitely know spring is coming. And maybe you've heard this song already and you just didn't know what it was. I never know if it's going to play again, but I think it's maybe done. <laughs> so this one, uh, the Dark Eyed Junko is different again from the last ones we've heard because it's got a monotone pitch. It's playing the same note um, the whole time. It's not changing. It's not getting higher or lower. Um, it's staying the same. And this one is again quite fast. You wouldn't be able to count each of the individual notes. They're too close together. Um, and as I said, it's not um, singing any different notes. It's playing the same note every time. So when you have a fast song that's the same note, we call that a trill. And you'll see the word trill written in a lot of field guides um, and song descriptions if it has this very quick, repetitive song type. Um, and though it is uh, sort of bland, I guess, maybe, or less, less exciting song than the purple finch, it does have sort of a clear ringing sound or tone to it. So you can listen to that again and see if you can pick out some of those things. Okay. And dark eyed juncos, um, they can also have higher or lower songs, but they'll always be the same note throughout it. And they can also be a bit faster or a bit slower. So they can have some variation between individuals, but they all have this sort of ringing quality to them. Um, I wanted to show you all the fox sparrow song because um, it's a personal favorite of mine. And also Catherine thinks that they sound like they're drunk. Um, my partner thinks they sound like they're sassy, so <laughs> you never know what people are going to um, associate them with, but I'll let you listen to a fox sparrow. They can be sassy drunks, Jenna. Well, that's true. <laughs> So that's the fox sparrow song. Um, they, ha they have a lot of different notes. They sort of rise and fall in pitch. Um, but it's quite slow again. You can count each of the notes separately. And the tone is sort of a rich whistle, I would say, but some of you might describe it in a different way and it might sound different to each of you as well. So um, that's something that you can um, think about when you hear fox sparrows yourself. I'll play it one more time. Perfect. Okay, so we'll move on to the black and white warbler. Um, I don't think I've shown you a warbler yet, so this one sounds quite a bit different than the ones we've heard already. You'll, I'll let you listen to it now.
So the black and white warbler, it sort of alternates between high and low notes. And uh, because of that, we can say that it does repeat things. It repeats uh, a two note phrase. So it has a high and a low note in a phrase and it repeats that over and over. So it goes high, low, high, low, high, low, and then takes a break. Um, the speed is quite fast. It's hard to count each of the notes in there. They're quite close together. And it has a pretty squeaky sort of tone. A lot of people describe a black and white warbler as sounding like a squeaky wheel. So if you imagine what a squeaky wheel would sound like rolling down the street, uh, you could maybe associate a black and white warbler with that. I'll let you listen to it again. So that's the black and white warbler. And this is the last bird I think I'm gonna show you tonight. Um, this is the belted kingfisher and they have a very unique sound. So, um, and I think it's maybe considered technically a call, but um, I think it's an interesting one to help you guys learn because um, it's really cool when you can hear one and know that it's a belted kingfisher. So. Take a listen and see if you've heard it before. So they actually make that sound as they're flying. So you might hear it passing by you um, as they fly over a river or the edge of a pond or something like that. Um, and it's the same note over and over again. So it's monotone. The pitch is not rising or falling and it is repeating the whole time. And it's a very fast song. So each of the notes, you definitely wouldn't be able to count them separately. Um, and it's sort of a dry rattle for the vocal quality of this one. Kind of sounds like someone shaking a rattle. I'll play it for you one, once more here. Okie dokie. So I'll just uh, mention, and Andres had it a little, uh, mentioned it for a second in, in his section as well, um, the use of technology with bird songs. So technology can be really helpful when learning to bird by ear because you can record an unknown song or a song that you want to listen to more when you're out outside um, exploring and you can bring it back home with you and listen to it or compare to field uh, audio field guides, that sort of thing. Um, so it can be a really good tool for that. Um, there's also an app for smart devices called Merlin. It's from the Cornell Nap Lab of Ornithology. And actually it has a section now where it has automated song ID. So you could just press the record button when you're out, outside um, and birds are singing and it will pick up the bird song and give you um, some automatic identifications. And it's usually pretty good and pretty accurate. It's not always accurate because it is automated, um, but it's definitely a really cool learning tool if you are into bringing your phone or whatever out with you when you're going outside. Um, and as I mentioned, you can make recordings on smart devices um, to bring them back home with you. And a sort of more professional, version of making recordings on smart devices is using um, handheld recorders that are specifically made for recording sound, um, like Zoom devices, which I actually had one that I have stashed under the desk here um, <laughs> that is in a box still. I was going to show it to you. But anyway, it's just a handheld recorder that's specifically made for recording sound. And uh, uh, we actually use them at the Atlas and lend them out to volunteers who want to do point counts and survey birds by sound, but aren't quite confident in the identification yet. And they use these Zoom recorder devices, and then we can bring them back and look at the spectrograms later or the sonograms and also listen to them and sort of uh, identify the species at a later time. And uh, another version of using technology for bird song identification is using automated recording units. And that's what you can see in the picture here attached to the tree. Um, automated recording units or ARUs are 
are devices that you can put outside in the woods or just anywhere outside and you leave them out there and pre-record pre um, when they'll turn on and when they start collecting songs. They have two microphones on them. They'll start collecting song files and then you can go collect your ARU from the tree several weeks or several months later. Um, and then you can download all of the files and you have all of this bird song information about what was at the location that the ARU was out. So we also use those for the Atlas to access sort of remote areas as well. It's very cool. Okay, so we're on to now uh, everybody's favorite spot <laughs> of the night maybe <laughs> where we get to test our skills. So we're only going to do five questions tonight. Um, and I'm going to play you a bird song and you can pick which bird you think it is. So I'll we'll have a poll come up as well. Doo -doo -doo. So, which species is this? I think a lot of people are familiar with this one. I'll just close it down in a couple of seconds. Okay. Very good. We have 85% of people. And so this is what everybody thought a common loon, 100% accuracy. Well done, everybody. This is, in fact, a common loon. Um, and that's amazing. So you already know one species by, <laughs> by song. Okay, let's go on to our next one. If I can manage it. And what is this? Okay, lots of people answering. I really love that. So I'll show you what everybody said. And uh, most people got it right. This is an American robin. Well done. Um, and so purple finch is a, a good answer. And uh, that's because they have the same sort of vocal quality, this uh, sort of whistling, this like pure whistling sound. Um, and a hermit thrush is also related to American robin. Uh, they're both thrushes, so they have similar sounding songs as well um, in vocal quality. Um, a purple finch will have a much faster song that goes up and down a little bit more. But good job, everybody. Okay, let's go on to the next one. They will work. Oops. Let's try that again. I love how enthusiastic everybody is with answering, even though these are tricky. I will close this one and show everybody. 
um, that 70% got it right. This was a black and white warbler. Well done. Um, they sound like that squeaky wheel squeaking uh, down the street. The dark eyed junco plays or sings only one monotone song very quickly called the, it's a, called a trill. Um, and black throated green warbler sings its own name as well. Actually, I like to say it says black, black throated green. <laughs> um, anyway, I shouldn't be a bird song specialist, I guess. Uh, but good job, everybody. Black and white warbler. We'll move on to the next one. I keep cutting it off in the middle. I'll close this one down and show you what everybody got here. Oh, there's a few answers still coming in. I'll play it one more time. <laughs> okay, so this was in fact a white-throated sparrow. Good job, everybody. Um, sounds like this is a more familiar one, or we played it enough tonight in this webinar, which just goes to show that if you practice enough, you can learn anything. Um, so that's a white-throated sparrow. They say, oh, sweet, Canada, Canada, Canada. A fox sparrow is related. So that's um, a very good guess. And they have a bit more variation in the notes that they sing and they sound like they're drunk or sassy according to some folks here. <laughs> um, but well done everybody. Okay, so we're on to our fifth one here and our final one. And I will show you your options so I don't cut it off part way. Oh, I didn't launch it. Sorry. Okay, I'll play it once more. Okay, I'll close that one down and show you all. So that was a belted kingfisher, well done. Um, it sounds like that sort of dry rattle um, that you hear uh, flying by you around water. Um, well done, everybody. I'm very impressed with your bird identification skills and I hope that this has given you some um, hope for your learning skills, because I think you've all done spectacularly. Okay, we'll just move along. I have one more slide here, just to show you um, some resources that can help you as you go through your learning of bird songs. So, and I will put all of these into the follow-up email with links and stuff so you can get there, but I'll just quickly go through what they are. Um, <clears throat> sorry, and how they work. So there are some um, resources that you can use as quizzes. So there's one called Larkwire um, and you can have, it's partially paid and partially free. You can sort of pick and choose what you pay for, I think. Um, and I know Catherine uses it and a lot of other um, birders use it as well and really like it. It's sort of a game-based quiz um, where it gives you certain options and you can pick between them. Um, and they show up on the screen, that sort of thing. But Catherine can explain more about that if anyone has questions about it. Um, there's a website called Dendroika, 
and it's free. You can make lists of birds on there with a free account. Um, so you can practice certain families or certain sounds, certain vocal qualities, and make quizzes uh, for yourself on there. There's a lot of a lot of different sound files on there. And then there's also one called Bird Song Hero. It's a free, it's a very short game, but it includes spectrograms. So you can sort of practice reading spectrograms if that's something that interests you. And they're not necessarily all birds from Newfoundland, but um, it's kind of fun anyway. Um, there's also a lot of good song libraries that you can find. The Macaulay Library um, is sort of what's connected to eBird. Um, it's where all of the media files go. And so you can um, just sort of explore different bird songs there. You can choose the species, you can choose the location. So you could look at only Newfoundland birds um, and listen to songs on there. Um, Dendroica, I have it under the quizzes section here as well, but it also is just sort of a repository or library for songs as well as photos. Um, so it's a good one that you can just sort of go through and explore uh, and practice different songs on there. And then I mentioned earlier the Merlin bird, uh, the Merlin app that's from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And that also has um, each of the species that's included in it has um, a bunch of different songs and calls that you could listen to on there. So these are all good resources to use. And again, I'll put those in the follow-up email. Okay, so thank you everybody. That brings us to the end um, of tonight and also our whole webinar series for the Birds of Newfoundland. Um, I'm really glad that you all were able to come tonight. And before you go, we are hoping to get some feedback on tonight's webinar and the series in general. So um, Catherine, could you put the link for the survey into the chat box? And if um, folks have a chance, it just takes a couple of minutes to provide us with some really important feedback about um, how you thought the webinar series went. And if you have any other sort of feedback, um, it'll be really important for us to, to see your, your responses on there. Um, and you shouldn't need to sign into Google or anything. You should be able to just open it in any browser. And if it's not working, you can open it in an incognito window and it should work just fine then. Um, again, since I said I'd mention it, if you do wish to send us a donation, feel free to go to our website. Um, I have it written on the slide here. Go to the Get Involved tab and then the Donate button um, and just feel uh, be sure to indicate that you would like the funds to go to the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, not required, but welcomed. Um, and we're just happy to have had all of you come out for this series. And uh, I will be sending out an email with the survey link um, and this sort of donation information as well. So if you've already done those things, just feel free to ignore it, but I'll be compiling um, all of the emails of folks who have come to any of the, any of the series evenings. Um, so just so you know, that will be coming out as well. And as always, pipe up with questions or maybe there's some in the chat because I see there's 64 things in there. <laughs> um, so Jenna, I think they're, they're mostly thank yous. It's, it's people telling you what a great job you did. So, and uh, thanking us for the, the webinar series overall, which is really, really great. We're really glad that you've all been able to make it out. Um, I did put that, uh, that link to the survey in there a few times. So if you get a chance, please do give us some feedback because uh, we'd like to know what we could do better and uh, what you enjoyed. And yeah, it's, it's just wonderful to hear from you all. Um, and as Jenna said, we certainly appreciate any donations to the Atlas. Those of you who are in Newfoundland or find yourself in Newfoundland for any part of the summer, you can also uh, participate by just getting involved, signing up for the Atlas. Absolutely. And you can always feel free to reach out to us by email um, and uh, feel free to follow our social media because we post things on there and little contests and stuff like that as well sometimes. So stay Thank in touch. <laughs> And perhaps we'll see some of you at uh, some of our bird walks. That schedule yeah. we will be posted on the Atlas website once it's determined and on our Facebook as well. Um, and really thank you everyone for the really kind comments. This, uh, this series has been a lot of work for Jenna and I, but it's worth it when we see that people are really enjoying it. So, um, and if there are any questions, maybe retype your question because there were there's a lot flying past right there and I've been trying to keep an eye on it, but I may have missed something. So if I've missed a question, let me know. Or also to feel free to unmute yourself and you can probably speak out loud. Yeah, you just like. unmute yourself and ask. <laughs>
And anybody who supports me and thinks that the fox sparrow sounds drunk, feel free to speak up because Jenna doesn't buy it. But I think it <laughs> sounds all slurred. So That's no, I get where you're coming from for sure. It's just a really funny thing to think of. <laughs> that is how I learned that song. For the first month I was here, I could not remember a fox sparrow song. And then it clicked in my head that they were the ones sounding drunk out there. So <laughs> Yeah, that's something I actually meant to mention earlier is that, um, you know, you might listen to a lot of bird songs over and over on your computer or, or on your phone or whatever, and you maybe just feel like you're not getting it. And someday it will just click. I've had that happen with so many species. Like I couldn't tell a black cap chickadee and a boreal chickadee apart forever. And one day I just knew the difference. So be patient with yourself uh, and sort of take it as a fun learning opportunity. <laughs> Definitely. Absolutely. Okay, yeah, Jessica, swinging of a foxtail. Yeah, I can see that too. I can definitely see that, but yeah. I prefer to think of them stumbling home with a pint still in their hands. They could be wearing a fox costume and swinging their foxtail as they do that too. <laughs> they could be, yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. All right, well, I don't see any, any questions here, Jenna. So again, you guys can always reach out to us by email uh, or on Facebook. We're happy to answer questions at any time. And Thank you all for coming out. That's perfect. Thanks so much, everybody. And feel free to reach out. Have a good night. Have a good night. <laughs>